from Kansas State to the 18 Hill Howard. Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. We are from K-State Online, bringing you uh, the best and uh, the most comprehensive Cats coverage over on On3. And we come to you on this Wednesday, December 6th, with some not very fun conversations. Because Colin Klein, after being a little weary that he would leave for the Notre Dame job last year, he did not end up doing that. He stayed in Manhattan. Uh, just before the basketball game last night, the the TV reporter down in Houston threw out the the message of, "Hey, he's been offered the A and M job. He turned down Penn State last week." Which at first, even still, it is very funny that Colin Klein turned down Penn State and Andy Kotelnicki ended up with the job. Um, that is funny in itself. What came after that? Not so funny because there became serious momentum that Colin Klein would take the Texas A&M offensive coordinator job and join their new head coach, Mike Elko, down there. That is indeed the case now. Uh, Colin Klein off to Texas A&M. K-State only gets two seasons with him as their offensive coordinator. It resulted in a Big 12 title and one of, if not the Big 12's best offense over the last two seasons. Uh, how did this all come about, and, and where is your surprise level in terms of Colin Klein, number one, getting this offer, and then the fact that he actually took it. Pretty pretty stunned, right? Um, because I guess I was just, and I say common sense, but I was saying if you don't take Notre Dame, you don't take Penn State, there's rumor that the Alabama job was floating there for him at 1.2. If you don't take those jobs, I just – I guess I assumed that Kansas State was out of the woods, and now we find out that they aren't. I, I guess I don't have a ton of more commentary to give you, but that that's the reasoning. I thought I knew teens would still keep coming for them, right, because they did it after year one, and they already did it this offseason when Penn State had to resort to Kotelnicki and – you knew other teams were sniff, sniffing around, but at the end of the day, I just thought Kansas State was out of the woods because he had turned down his opportunities prior to this one. It's interesting that AM is the one he jumps on, right? You wonder what was the inflection point, what was the trigger that decided none of those other parallel lateral programs to AM were good enough for him, but AM was. Maybe it's a, a head coach in Mike Elko that has enough staffing flexibility because he hasn't made all of his hires yet to give Colin Klein some power there that maybe otherwise wouldn't have somewhere else that already had an established coaching staff. Yeah, the, this is one of those deals where, I mean, I, I thought initially I was like, well, okay, that's fine and dandy that they can offer this to him. But, you know, if you're turning down some of these others, why would you choose a and um, But I think at the end of the day, I mean, it, it just comes down to, what Notre Dame and obviously Penn State then left out there. They had the prestige of the job. You go to one of those schools, you're in a you're in a different class than K-State. But obviously, you know, the the money thing, there wasn't enough of a difference. And uh, at some point, like this is this doesn't make Colin Klein a bad guy. It doesn't mean he he dislikes K-State uh in any fashion or any less. Like this is just one of those deals where even in a situation where you have a lot of love in your heart and you you feel like you should be somewhere, if you get an opportunity that has a lot more money attached to it, like you get into a position where you become silly to, to not you know take it because you, you, you have a family, you have all these other obligations, and there's also a status thing that comes with this. Like Colin Klein's obviously on a pretty good trajectory right now in his coaching career. And I do think that he could probably have ended up you know, if 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 Chris Klein is going to be here for a while, and all indications seem to uh, point towards that he will be, then Colin Klein was not going to be the head coach at K State at any time soon. But he, I think, he could have gone to become a head coach from being the offensive coordinator at K State. What this does, though, is Colin Klein successful in two years at Texas A and M. I mean, he, he's he's not only a head coach somewhere in two years, he's a Power Five head coach, and honestly, like he can get one of those fringe SEC jobs or somebody with real money would come at him and say, you're our guy if he can create a, a fantastic offense at Texas A&M. Like, 
that's where he's putting himself into in addition to, you know, obviously the financial gains that come from this move to Texas A&M. I'm not saying it, it shouldn't hurt to K-State fans. It absolutely should. Um, it's always unfortunate when somebody that, you know, you feel like is your own and obviously Colin is, uh, makes this decision and goes somewhere else. And it's, it's tough. Like, we can write it off with other guys. Like the Sean Snyder KU thing, we can write it off because we know that Sean Snyder is pretty spiteful, or at least there are elements of spite to what he's doing there. This one hurts because, like, this is – obviously, if Colin Klein was getting paid the same same money at K-State and Texas A&M, I would imagine he probably doesn't leave K-State. But Texas A&M's in a total different ballpark, as they've showcased by how much in buyout money they could give to Jimbo Fisher and how they're they're going to pay. They're aggressive. And I, you know, I would almost venture to guess that this is one of those deals where this is like the AM administration is building like a super staff. And maybe Mike Elko had some say, and I'm sure he wasn't against Colin Klein, but this feels almost like more of a move that the athletic director said, Hey, we had kind of this team look over some possible hires for you. Here's who we really think we should go after. And they didn't want to whiff. They want to do this right this time because the more AM misses out and makes mistakes, they become a bigger laughing stock in an SEC that's getting more talented and bigger with OU and Texas coming. So they have to get it right this time. And uh, obviously, Colin Klein, they feel like, is a giant piece to that puzzle. Yeah. And, you know, based on everything that I've learned in the last, what, about 16 hours, I would imagine that you're right about the super staff idea and they're saying this is probably a good way to go. But I think this was probably Elko's guy all along as well, or at least the thought of it when he took the job, right? Because, you know, based on things that are unfolding, it sounds like Colin Klein's going to have the ability to make some of the offensive hires on the coaching staff. And you don't do that unless the head coach really wants you. So I think that's part of it. You're right and that you can parlay one or two years of very high success as a Texas A&M play caller to a very wide array of jobs, right, in the Power Five. Uh, what I will say is that he didn't have to leave Kansas State to get the Kansas State head coaching job. So it's interesting to me that he still chose to leave because, one, that says that he didn't want to be patient enough or didn't think that there was going to be an opening soon enough in Kansas yeah. state to reward him as soon as he would like with the head coaching job in Manhattan or two, he just maybe isn't cutting it or, you know, isolating himself to only the Kansas state job, which is a little concerning. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I just view it as a guy that, you know, you, you realize what your worth is and what your your talent level is, and you say, "Look, I can I can keep doing this for however long, and I really enjoy it." And obviously, I I would think that the ultimate goal for Colin Klein would be that he would love nothing more than be to be the head coach at K State. But he's probably a guy that, yeah. But he's probably a guy that if he's that good of a coach, he can probably recognize it as well. And and Chris Kleiman and understands, look, I don't think Kleiman's going anywhere anytime soon. And I can always make that move back if if I want to and if that opportunity comes. But I think he's going to be there a while, so I might as well get my clock started somewhere else and see what happens and and how things go. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, the, the right decision, we don't know what it is until uh, everything plays out over the course of a couple of years. But it certainly stings for K-State right now. Puts them in a really tough spot with you know you got the bowl game in 22 days you've got signing day in less than that um you've got an and the transfer portal obviously is popping off you have so many things this time of year that uh it's tough and obviously this is when coaching carousel stuff goes on but this is a, a tough spot for k-state and probably the biggest element to what the colin klein leaving for a&m thing does to the k-state fan base and everybody that's wondering is where does that leave the status of Avery Johnson at K-State? Because obviously losing Colin Klein is a big blow. He has done numerous things to make this K-State offense not only more successful on the field, but also off the field in terms of recruiting. I mean, we've talked about it numerous times this year and, you know, in, you know, before we were even working together years past. Like Colin Klein being the offensive coordinator at K-State 
gave them the opportunity to start to infuse more talent at like the wide receiver spot. And the offense was in a position where it was becoming more attractive to different players to want to come to Kansas State. If you were to lose Avery Johnson, which I'm sure a lot of people's minds go to, you know, you lose your offense coordinator and quarterbacks coach that was able to kind of sell the dream to him. Uh, that would be the absolute worst case scenario and probably the biggest blow to K-State football in a long, long time. Uh, wh where do you expect the impact to fall with Avery Johnson uh, in, in Colin Klein? I don't know. I think – I will say this. Early indications are promising, but I don't know that we have our answer yet because things can always change on a whim. Um your report, you're reporting, uh, and when you're in the media, you're reporting in in this new era where you get the NIL and transfer portal intersecting, and it can get a little, you know, complicated because of that. Your reporting sometimes the the life of a report doesn't last long at all. So mm -hmm. I, I can say it sounds promising now, but it could be not promising in two hours. So yeah. take it for what it's worth and with a grain of salt. But I think early indications are strong and are positive. Um, that doesn't mean that it is eternal. So that that's where it stands right now with Avery Johnson. Yeah. Uh, going going beyond that is that if he chooses to leave, and I don't think he's going to follow Colin Klein to Texas A and M for the record. If you were to enter the transfer portal, he's going somewhere else. He's not going to Texas A&M. But if he were to go to the portal, I mean, it's about as doomsday as it could possibly be. And and I, mm -hmm. I hate saying that, and I don't say that lightly. I'm typically a pretty positive and an optimistic person that tries to find the glass hole half full scenario. There is not one if Avery Johnson leaves, because Avery Johnson leaving, heck, I don't really know if you have a scholarship quarterback on the roster at that point. I don't think you do you probably have other offensive guys consider the same thing yep. because they, they have all their, their Avery guys at this point, the ones that are staying. Um, and are they going to stay when they don't even know who their quarterback is? You would have to rebuild everything from the ground up almost. And that doesn't even include hiring offensive coordinator. So to be, and, and these two things kind of go hand in hand, but number one goal is to not even, hired off a of coordinator. <laughs> yeah. Number one goal is to keep Avery Johnson. But yeah. to do that, you have to hire an offensive coordinator that he's probably um, supportive of. So yeah. those two things do go hand in hand. What I will say is, like as a fan, or and this is what I would say <laughs> to fans, the way you got to see it is that if Avery Johnson stays, things are going to be fine. If he doesn't, it's going to be a rough, rough, rough off season and maybe next year, probably next season. So a lot rides on this. Um, it sucks that they're in this position, but it is what it is at this point. So a lot rides on that and it'll be interesting the path forward. But again, I will say this, two things. One, one, if Avery Johnson come, is, comes back and has given it at least a year with his boys, things are great. Two, even if he if he doesn't, short term, things get a little ugly and uncomfortable. Long term, still, I, I would. This isn't the death knell of Kansas State football, though. I mean, yeah. they're, they're not going back to the '80s because of this. But it's going to take a recovery period where you, you could have some struggling seasons. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it sets you back in a big way. I mean, it, you're right to use the term doomsday. If if, if Avery Johnson is to leave, and it's not it's not just the fact that you lose, obviously, this awesome talent in state that everybody is so excited for. Like, I I don't think there has been a player that K State fans have been this excited about in my in my lifetime in terms of from like before they even got to K State to where the hype still is this year. And what that sets up if he is to leave is, I mean, you're you're down to one quarterback who was a walk-on this year, and you're looking around for answers. And like you said, other offensive guys probably enter the, the portal then. And 
you just it, it's a it's a major blow and you've got to try and rebuild this thing back up in a way that you really didn't anticipate uh, because the one thing that you at least had when you know Chris Kleiman took over a a roster that wasn't very stable in terms of its depth was you had a quarterback in place that you trusted and liked in Skylar Thompson in 2019 and then obviously there was a you know a, an awkward transition to Adrian Martinez but it ultimately ended up working out with Will Howard and now you feel like you you're set here this this disrupts that process and it just puts you in a really tough spot and I mean at the end of the day I logically speaking it at this stage in his career does it not feel like the best option like NIL wise for Avery Johnson would be at K-State I know obviously there's the actual football side of this that matters a ton too because if you're that talented you've got other aspirations and the football is still important but obviously the NIL plays a factor and I you know he's obviously a talented dude and teams would shell it out for him but I'm not sure that his impact quite yet without playing, you know, many snaps can be what it is at K-State as the local guy and the, you know, basically the the guy that's in the prophecy like Anakin Skywalker. Uh, it, I think if I were Avery Johnson because of the very lucrative and comfortable NIL package I already have at Kansas State and the relationships that I've probably formed, with my teammates, I would stick it out of Kansas State a year, especially for my love and loyalty to the university and to that roster and to the coaches that are staying, even if Klein is leaving, just because this is what I committed to and I can be the loyal guy that kind of resurrects this or saves this, right? Um, he has a golden opportunity to even be more of a savior than – what people already adore him as yeah, at this true. point. Um, his 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 light could shine even brighter if he does this. And he's already being taken care of NIL-wise to do that. Um, I think that's in the best interest of his career because you're not guaranteed anything when you transfer somewhere else, especially when most of these places are going to have an older guy that you might have to compete with or – battle with and the NIL and other places he could probably get that but uh, assuming he's the unquestioned starter there's just not a ton of places out there that'll provide him with the clearest path to being the starter that he actually has at Kansas State so that's that gives me a little bit of comfort but again this offensive coordinator is probably going to be impactful in that way because he's going to want to trust and be supportive of that person as well and be like he's in good hands so we'll see what happens but you do have to still take that into consideration that your best situation playing time plus you're already going to take care of nil might be still like kansas state um and at least might be worth going a year with your boys that you just formed with a tight relationship with for that year uh giving it a year and see how we're going to rock and if we can rock. Um, and then at that point, it's it's up to Kansas State to do what they can and what they have to do. That's Chris Kleiman and the offensive staff that whatever the offensive staff looks like to put their best foot forward so they can get more of them just that one more year. Well, what what does it what does it look like then in terms of what the options can be offensive coordinator wise for K State? Because I mean it's it's one of those deals where you know Chris Kleiman's a defensive coach. Uh, he's also a guy that he does he doesn't have any Power Five or experience or FBS experience until he was the head coach at K State. So how how wide is the network and and what should a search for an offensive coordinator look like for K State? You got to hire someone that still plays a modern brand of offensive football <laughs> because. It was it was Avery's because a lot of this is good. People hate this. A lot of this is about keeping Avery Johnson happy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and making him I, feel I, like honestly the the entire hire because you said it best, you know, early on. Like Avery Johnson can can make an average offensive coordinator do great things. This entire hire, I mean, even if you feel like okay, this thing could go to crap in three or four years, and we got to get started new. 
whatever you have to do to keep Avery Johnson happy with this hire, that's what you do here if you're K-State. I think so. People hate giving that power to someone that's probably 19 or 20 years old, but guess what? Um, Kansas State's fate in the immediate future rests in Avery Johnson's hands. It really does. Um, I'm sure he knows that at this point. That's probably a lot of pressure for him, and it's probably a lot of pressure for the rest of the coaching staff because, you know, if they don't know that, they better know that, and they better find out quickly. Um, so it'll be interesting, but I think it's still someone that's got to be introducing or – maintaining a modern brand of offensive football that Avery Johnson wants to play. In. I mean, that's what it's about. Is that promoting someone internally? Is that going and getting someone? I don't know. Um, not that there's any connection between this guy and the current Kansas State coaching staff, because I don't know of one. And not that I've heard that he's a candidate because I haven't. So don't, don't rush to conclusions or think that I'm saying things in between the lines here. But Brandon Marion, of the office corner at UNLV that I've seen post as a a guy, a guy that Kansas, Kansas State should chase, I agree with. That's that's an offensive style of football that I think would, you know, make Avery Johnson happy. And he's a proven really good coach. He was a wide receivers coach at Texas. Um, he was a, well, for Steve Sarkeesian, I believe. He was a wide receiver coach at Pittsburgh when they had Jordan Addison before he transferred to USC. So he's a guy that can really develop that part of the, the offensive game. I'm not saying that Chris Klein is going to go call that guy today. He might not. I don't know of any prior connections. There doesn't have to be a prior connection as far as I'm concerned. But at least I don't know of anything that would link those two together just yet. But you, know, you asked me someone specific, I throw that name out because he's a young, bright offensive mind and Kent State needs to go – along that route, in my opinion. Now, I also said before to Colin Klein, you know, he's now at Texas A&M. I think part of the part of the the allure of him going there was that, that he gets to make some of the hires, I think, to build out the rest of the offensive staff. You know, you hear rumors about a tight end coach, a wide receiver coach, an analyst. And if you're Kansas State, you're kind of looking around like, uh, we don't want to lose these guys that are yeah. already in this post. So, um but I will say if Klein does that, man, he's really training his way to being a villain. So we'll see if he actually plucks away from the Kansas State coaching yeah. staff. Yeah. Should I should I should I take this down right now, DY? Is that what you're saying? I should take well, the Well, how would you feel if he took two or three coaches or assistants away from right, well, or well, else away from Kansas State that it could also hinder their ability to retain? We'll just we'll just put we'll just tuck this away for a little bit. It'll it'll face against the wall. Well, actually. I'll flip it around and uh, we can look at the uh, Samsung Galaxy S3 that was big at the time uh, that K State was number one in the country. So we're, uh, you know, even though I've never owned a Samsung product in my life, uh, I guess except a TV, but I, I was gifted that. So whatever. Uh, look, I this is a tough situation for K State. I, I don't know what to to expect from this. Um, but as I, honestly, like to keep optimism in people, I, I think you and I both agree, at least for the next year, Avery Johnson's best option is still at K-State. And for a lot of different reasons, you should have faith that Chris Kleiman will go out there and make the right hire um, because he's he's been able to bring a strong staff into K-State before and uh, he'll be able to, to likely do it again. But as long as you keep Avery Johnson, I think you salvage this a little. It's not as big of a deal, and I can stomach it a bit more. But if this does trigger a trickle-down effect where it's Colin Klein goes to A&M, Avery Johnson decides this isn't what I signed up for at K-State, and as much as I love being the, the in-state hero and everything, I got to move on, uh, and he's gone. That really stings, and that, that does put Klein in a more villainous light. And then, obviously – if he starts taking other staff members to go with him down there, that's a significant deal as well. So this this is a tough spot. It's tricky. It's never fun uh, for for anybody. Like it's not fun for K State fans, and I'm I'm sure it's not fun for Colin Klein. Like it might be pretty sweet when you know he he's checking Commerce Bank in a couple of weeks, and he's like, dang, the A and M money hits a little different. But uh, I don't think that like. He, he is excited about spurning K-State for this opportunity. It's obviously something that he had to think pretty hard about. And, you know, there was conflicting 
moments for him. But at the end of the day, when you have a family and you have a lot of other things and aspirations, you get an opportunity like this where the money probably becomes too good to pass up. And obviously the opportunity here, like I think succeeding as the coordinator at A&M puts you in a different stratosphere than even if he had succeeded at Notre Dame or Penn State. Um, I just think it, it, it speeds up his track. Uh, even more so. So that is the the notes on Colin Klein as he is leaving K-State to head to Texas A&M. Yet again, the Texas A&M Aggies pull a fast one on K-State football and and screw them in ways that are just unimaginable. So It's, all, it's always Texas A&M. Always Texas A&M. Golly. Uh, speaking of K-State football, before we shift into basketball real quick, uh, let's talk about the transfer portal for the Wildcats. They've had a handful of more guys go in there since we talked about it last. Uh, we know the entire quarterback room is gone. Will Lee is into the portal now. Uh, and then they've lost some other guys. Anthony Frias, a running back, is gone. May not be any running backs uh, on, on the, the bowl game roster outside of DJ Giddens. Uh, and then Nate Matlack is probably another significant one that everybody is aware of that has gone into the transfer portal. So what is... Uh, the the thought process on the current state of the portal for K-State in terms of what they've lost, what happens there, and then uh, where they should start hunting for guys to come in. The only one that really stung or disappointed the coaching staff was Nate Matlack. Everything else was either anticipated, um, encouraged, or predi- predi- predicted, right? Um, but I do think there's more coming. Uh, and it's guys like basically that have a COVID year left or guys that were not um, going to contribute in another season. So, you know, you still, you still look at, you're waiting and see if something happens like with an RJ Garcia, with a Jaden Jackson or with a Brendan Mott. Um, and those are the three that kind of come to mind for me. And <laughs> aside from that, can't think of anything too much just yet. Uh, but, you know, Unfortunately, the, this what transfer portal is open almost another month, so yeah. surprises will probably happen. Uh, they had, when I say had, maybe they have. Um, I just don't know how things get affected when you bring in uh, visitors from the transfer portal that are on the offensive side of the ball, or even high school recruits too. How that affects when you don't have your offensive coordinator. Um, yeah. That, that's interesting because, like, they have Davon Rice, a high school running back, coming in this weekend for an official visit. They they have an offensive lineman transfer coming in um, as well for a visit. Uh, the Butler defense alignment, and then I think one other one. I think they had at least four others booked for the following weekend. But does the Klein stuff – do you run into a wall there? I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to uh, I will say, see. Yeah, I'll say that. Um in the past, Colin Klein has taken has been patient and taking his good old time with hires. And I understand that's a process that he believes in. And maybe he sticks with that. But I think with the current situation, he needs to I believe he needs to accelerate that yeah. timetable. You gotta act fast in this situation. The 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 circumstances are a lot more dire this year than than what they've been in the past in terms of what you need to accomplish and just how significant next year will be for K-State. So we'll see how it ends up uh, going on from there.